Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for making it uh, despite the snow and despite like 20 other events happening at the same time, uh, not to mention uh, <coughs> other great talks in the other tracks of uh, WASMCon. Uh, my name is Ram. I work at the Linux Foundation. I help manage the community around a couple of projects, one of them focused on open source security. And so I thought this would be a good opportunity to get together some uh, great folks from the WASM ecosystem to discuss security uh, you know, aspects of WASM in general. Uh, I'm going to let folks quickly introduce themselves. Uh, Luke, why don't we start with you? Sure. Hello, I'm Luke Wagner. I work at Fastly in the Office of uh, Technology Research and Incubation, work on WebAssembly standards uh, and evolution. I was one of the co-creators of WebAssembly back when I was at Mozilla working on Firefox, and yeah, now working on WASing the Component Mall. Hi, my name is Bailey Hayes. I am the CTO at Cosmonic, which is a company that builds uh, a WASM Cloud platform, um, application platform. Um, I also serve uh, as Bytecode Alliance Technical Steering Committee Director and uh, also one of the co-chairs for the WASI subgroup within the W3C's WebAssembly Community Group. I've been doing WebAssembly stuff since 2012, if you count ASM.js, and uh, got to run into folks like Luke who were doing cool, amazing experimental things upstream. And yeah, I, I always envied him, and I, I've, I only recently got to be involved in some of that standard side of things, uh, maybe two years ago. Um, I'm Ross Kolachi. I'm a principal PM at Microsoft. Um, Azure, uh, the group is Azure, uh, what is the group? What is my group? Azure Core Upstream, which does all the open source work uh, for a lot of services in, in Azure and across Microsoft. Um, that includes Kubernetes, but it includes WebAssembly as well. So that's what my team does. All right, considering that this is uh, happening alongside KubeCon and CloudNativeCon, I'm going to begin with um, the, a question about a lot of people who are you know, either here or watching this later might be entrenched in a container's world. So what is the difference or what is the change that you know, they ought to be mindful of as they're transitioning from a containers world to a WASM world, especially in terms of security? Um, I'll start. Yeah, uh, I think all of us will probably have something to say on that one. Um, so uh, a WebAssembly module or component, uh, it's really a dot .wasm, it's a, a compilation target. Uh, so when I'm coding in, let's say, Go, I say dash target, wasi p2, out comes a dot .wasm binary. Um, and so I'm able to run that now on any runtime, basically, that supports uh, WebAssembly. And uh, those are, there are a number of those. Um, there are plenty that are cloud native. Uh, Wasm Edge is a CNCF project that's a WebAssembly runtime. I am a maintainer on Wasm Cloud, that's a CNCF application platform. It embeds the Wasm time runtime inside it. Um, and so the way that in a cloud native world uh, that you take a, a WebAssembly module, that dot WASM, and send it to one of these application platforms running, let's say in Kubernetes, uh, the way that I would do that is I would package it inside OCI. And so we've done a lot of work, um, James Sturdivant and Taylor Thomas, uh, working within the CNCF's WASM working group. Uh, they've advanced the OCI spec forward to have a specification for WASM artifacts. Oh, also Luke, too, you worked on that. Um, sorry about that. Um, and so uh, we package it together in an OCI artifact. So um, what is great about that is that your existing tools basically just work with it. And the runtimes that are pulling that down, they know what they're downloading. They know the type of component, what it needs to be able to run. Uh, and so from an aspect of security, the thing that you can scan is you can look at that OCI artifact, know what a dot .wasm is, and crack that thing open and see exactly what it needs, exactly the APIs that it's trying to import. So let's say you want to add security for something uh, that says it needs WASI sockets, aka it needs a, a socket. Well, you need to make sure that you found a way to sandbox sockets safely to be able to run that component. What would you add? Um, wow. I, so that I report up through the AKS, so the Kubernetes experience, right, uh, at Azure and the Kubernetes teams. I guess for people who are trying to figure that out, the difference between containers and WebAssembly from that perspective, for example, would be something like um, there isn't really a container uh, in Kubernetes. There are, is only a process that is executing within a framework of certain C group and namespaces and sec comp and whatever else. So what that really means is that 
in Kubernetes, the way it works by default, uh, all the security configuration that you get for your native process is actually handled not in the container. It's handled by the OS mm -hmm. configuration in the node. Okay? And so what WebAssembly brings in addition to that is that WebAssembly actually executes inside a sandbox, and there's a specification for that and how it's supposed to be constructed and executed. And then that itself can be part of the entire security configuration all the way down. If you're thinking like, maybe you're thinking of running WebAssembly and Kubernetes, for example, you can actually put C groups and namespaces underneath that process and get sandboxing uh, at the WebAssembly level, at the per module level, for example, which could be each, which is typically each request, in addition to whatever configuration you've done for the actual process in Kubernetes. Um, and that allows you to have layered security values, for example. And that's just in the Kubernetes, in the Kubernetes environment. And if you're running a container outside of Kubernetes, you gotta do all that security work yourself. And with WebAssembly, by default, you still get the sandbox per execution. And so the default stance of WebAssembly is vastly superior, absent other contexts, other things you're doing with the process, than just the way you run a native process in containment, if that makes sense. Mm. And that, that, I think, helps the security conversation if you're coming from Kubernetes and containers a lot. Something to add to that, Leo? Well, yeah, those are great points. Y'all work a lot more with containers in practice than I do, <laughs> so I think that pretty much pretty well covers it. Cool. Um, I'm going to point this to you, Ralph. Um, the ecosystem seems like they're filled with amazing and smart engineers, but do you think they still end up doing dumb stuff in terms of um, you know, not adhering to... I, I think I'm triggered over the word dumb. <laughs> I think I'm, you're, you're, you're teeing me up. Listen, in, engineering is easy when you're building hello worlds. Right. And when you build real stuff that runs at high, high uh, throughput uh, with heavy workloads that cost people pay money for and so forth, engineering is extremely hard. Right. Okay? It's a very complex puzzle that we construct with colleagues, with the collaborators and organizations, with projects and all this kind of stuff. It's extremely hard. So the answer is, yeah, we all do dumb stuff. Everybody does. Sure. We're humans. Sure. Right? And when things get complex, maybe we're tired that day. Maybe it's an interruption in our thought process and <laughs> we don't complete some step. You know? So those things happen. Um, I do want to say that for people who are coming to WebAssembly, there's one thing that it's really important to sort of realize, that WebAssembly, <clears throat> almost all the code that we inherit and even the way we learn to program makes an assumption that we have an operating system underneath us. Hmm. And so when you start writing code, even for something like WebAssembly, you assume you have a file system, you assume you have networking, you assume you have some sort of chip that maybe has a GPU and something like that. And you can just use them. And the answer is you can do that in WebAssembly too, but every time you make an operating system as assumption, what you're saying is my code that I'm writing can do anything. Okay. And what the component model and WebAssembly generally gives you is the ability to constrain the attack surface from either inside the module with guest code or outside the module even, and from other, com from other modules, other components. That, for the next 10 years of distributed computing, is a critical security boundary. Okay. But there's one other problem that most people, when they're coming to WebAssembly, don't really realize, because you have to really get used to the spec, right? And that is that WebAssembly, unlike operating systems, doesn't have a concept of read-only memory inside the module. But we assume when we're writing to our, you know, is that read-only memory is a part of our security environment because we're used to that feature right. in operating systems. And so when we write code, we think, oh, it's great. You can read, the, one of the interesting things is you can read uh, research papers from 2019, 2020, 21, 21, and 22. And of all the security research papers, which I spent a large amount of time reading, <laughs> um, the single number one feature that is cited as a security flaw in WebAssembly is the lack of read-only memory. Okay. 
which means that other things inside the component can actually read memory that isn't theirs and do something with it. Mm -hmm. That seems like a flaw. It happens to be not really necessary in the way WebAssembly was evolved. Of course, I'm looking at Luke here because mm -hmm. I don't want to like stomp on Luke's foot or something. And, but this, it's because WebAssembly is not an operating system. And so one thing in the security thing, it, we need to remember when we're learning WebAssembly to not think automatically with the operating system assumption. You want to constrain what you consume, you want to constrain what other people consume from you, and then internally you're going to need to tighten the boundary of the code you use inside your, your module and your component in order to reduce the number of supply chain dependency attacks that we now know will occur <laughs> whether you want them or not, right? And the thing that I like about the component model, one of the reasons we invest in it, is that it allows every, the component model allows you to get that boundary in a lot more fine-grained solutions. That's a value in security that can be used to address what most people think of as a missing feature. Of course, we could modify the spec and add read or mem memory in the future. I'll ask you about that, <laughs> put you on the spot. But I think that is one of the things that I think people need to sort of have consciously in mind that that is a, it's a, it's a feature and it's designed that way, but it means that you have to think a little bit differently about how you build your modules and components. Any follow-up thoughts, Luke? Sure, yeah. So totally agreed. We all accidentally write dumb code sometimes. And so the way to sleep <laughs> easier at night is shrink that blast zone so when the worst thing happens, it's, it doesn't take down the whole fleet. Right. It just is a failure that we can wake up and so, you know, solve at our leisure. And that means shrink the blast zone and just put as you know, le least permissions and privileges into that blast zone so that when the worst thing happens, it's not that bad. It's both good for supply chain attacks, but also like fat fingering things. And that's just, yeah. you know, that's just how it goes. So, so that's great, and component model, yes, lets us have much smaller boundaries than before. But actually getting to the read-only memory part, this, was, this is a thing where there's some positive progress more recently. So initially, when we started WASM, everyone was like, well, of course we should have read-only memory, because everyone knows null should trap when you load from it. Mm -hmm. And then we went to some place to put our RO data. So we're like, yeah, well, clearly we should have an mprotect instruction to flip permissions. But the problem with that is, you know, our goal is to be, uh, goal is to be portable and run on a bunch of different operating systems. Well, not all operating systems give you mprotect, and some hardware doesn't even physically have an MMU, so it's not even possible to implement mprotect. And so we're like, okay, we, we want to run there. Also, like, this is a pretty serious OS functionality, and like, we can't anticipate all the consequences of this. And so I'm kind of glad we didn't, because in like a highly multi-tenant environment, we're running a lot, to, a lot of WASM in a single process on many cores, and protecting does a TLB shoot down that wakes up all the other processors and pauses them slightly. And this can dominate overall system performance. So it's kind of very lucky we didn't add this thing and everyone's setting it all the time because like our temporary assumptions at that time would have like had all these massive imp imp uh, impacts. So it's nice we know to have protect, but it's still annoying that nulls don't trap. I can just load from null and store to null and that we don't have a place to put read-only data. But there is a fortunately much simpler solution now being proposed as a sub-proposal of the memory control proposal that's being actively worked on. And the more simple idea, which is actually an old idea, which is finally kind of got to the front of the priority queue, is let's have on the type of a memory, let's be able to declare how many pages of no read, no write memory go at the beginning. And that's just a static constant. Today, implicitly, everything's none or zero. So the first page is readable, writable. But lets you declare one page or two pages are no read, no write. And then the next page is how many are read only. And with this more static allocation, where we start with no access, and then we start with read only, followed by all the normal memory, we can, if you don't have an MMU, if you don't have the magic hardware to help you, a simple subtraction before the bounce check, which you have to do, catches you without having to do the whole expensive software page table stuff. So good fallback performance, like modest mm -hmm. overhead when you don't have any hardware support. And if you only have an MPU, which is a lot of embedded has, and increasingly I hear like most of it does, you can enforce this because they have static uh, declarations of what regions of memory have what access. So we can finally get, get it's not the most higher order bit, but I think we mm -hmm. can finally address this original use case and hopefully that can stop writing papers that like, you know, ding us for you no know, read-only memory. <laughs> well, Even though I think the higher is what you said, smaller blast zones, yes. but less principle of least authority. So this, for, for people who are learning, that's the, the, the higher order bit, because of course we don't have this yet, but the point here is that even when that comes, your habit needs to be small blast zones, and you will need to think about the code, really the function code path, 
and deliver that in this in the you know the sense of you know Unix do one thing and do it well kind of concept. Um, I, I'll just finish my you know security. This is my one security <laughs> rant by saying that one of the consequences of this is that if you use all the WASI interfaces, for example, that comprise an entire operating system platform kind of call set, or if you create a custom one that allows you to do like POSIX completely and all this kind of thing, one of the problems is now you're essentially just writing native code. It's bundled in a, in a, in a module or a component, right? But essentially because of that inability to lock parts of memory, uh, you're now actually giving your, you know, whatever your malicious code, complete access not only to pilfer through your me memory, but also go ahead and exfiltrate it as well. And so not tightening down the, the, the exfiltration boundary as much as you can, as well as creating concrete boundaries for individual or cl small collections of functions is a larger problem that will eventually be bad for uh, us. Um, if we don't, if we if we end up thinking well, it's all just going to be an operating system through time, <laughs> um, sometimes it is, but a lot more it's not going to be. Anyway, that's one of those areas where I think it's not really dumb. Sure. It's that our habits of coding that we right. have will lead us to make mistakes that we didn't realize we were making. Um, I feel like we should just throw out down some examples of, of dumb mistakes that we might make. Um, maybe my dumb mistake is my, my language that I chose, and it's not a memory safe language, and I wrote a bug in my code that had a double after free. Well, now, because I'm running in WASM and I have this linear memory, I'm not allowed to reach outside of my memory. Uh, so when that happens, I'm going to trap as part of the runtime, and so I get to keep my bug all to myself and not impact anybody else. I think that's a really important thing to call out. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a whole host of uh, types of things that can happen. Ralph just mentioned WASI, and I feel like maybe we should level set. Um, that. Uh, stands for, well, I guess if, if you watch Luke's talk, you might already know, but uh, the WebAssembly system interfaces. Um, <laughs> system makes you think that it's very low level. It actually has some very high level ones like HTTP. Um, those are essentially interfaces that we're standardizing together, and we think really deeply about the sandbox ability of those interfaces. That's critically important for runtimes to implement and for uh, vendors who then will take a runtime and then also think about the right way to sandbox that and maybe even run in multi tenant environments. And what those is ultimately are, a WebAssembly module has imports and exports. So the things that it needs to run and things that uh, other things can call on it. And in those imports, you're pulling in something. It's like a function handle. Uh, but that could be a something to a lot of different things. It could be a something that is inside the WebAssembly runtime itself uh, that is providing some of those WASI interfaces. It's built into the runtime. Uh, but it could also be uh, something that the, an another thing embedded that runtime, and it's a host, and it's native code that they're doing their own thing on, and it, you don't have to, your imports don't have to be WASI imports. It could be anything. And so that's another thing that we're seeing in the industry, which is both great and terrifying, uh, because we are seeing a ton of people create their own APIs. They're providing these imports. They're creating native functionality, enabling hardware capabilities uh, by doing that, and uh, also you know, uh, introducing other areas that we need to think deeply about the security and sandbox properties of those uh, functions. Yeah, I'm just going to um, have you folks reiterate on the memory safety and isolation areas. Luke, I know you had written something up earlier this year about memory safety and isolation and things like that. Um, what are your thoughts about you know, these areas of security in the context of WASM? Yeah. Um, try to think. I wrote a linking document that explains some people think that in the component model, every single tiny library has to be in a separate memory. And so anytime I use like my left pad or whatever tiny library, it's going to be a separate component. I'm going to be doing lots of copying. Uh, you know, uh, a thing the component model lets you do is choose when you want two modules of code to share memory and when you mm -hmm. want them to be in separate components. And so this kind of gives the developer some degree of choice of here's a collection of code that I think is all, is all in the same trust zone. I'm going to give them the same capabilities. I'm going to put it all in one component. And this is like, you know, when I'm running JS and I import other JS packages, this probably is all going in one component. Mm -hmm. 
But you also have the ability to say, okay, well, this, this, this library I'm, I'm a little worried about. I, I don't know what's gonna happen here. It has a ton of dependencies or it's large or, or it's just in a different language and I have to. I'm gonna put in a separate component and I'm gonna think carefully about what imports I give to that thing so what it can do in the worst case. I'm gonna think about what its blast zone is. Maybe I don't wanna give it the same file system I have. I wanna give it a little virtualized file system that only has like three things I put in there because that's all I know it needs, but it wants a file system so I'm gonna give it a little virtual file system. So, the, maybe the thing uh, I'm trying to think of that I wrote earlier was this linking MD that's in the component model repo that describes how all this stuff comes together and like, oh, this, a lot of the normal tools they're used to, like static linking, dynamic linking, these fit into the picture, as well as the newer stuff like linking components together with WASM Compose. Um, but is there anything else? I, I, I would love it if you just gave us a level set on uh, how linear, linear memory works for modules. Yeah, that's, that's a great starting point. So, Oh, as a module uh, can only access memory that it either creates itself or it's given as an import. And so every time you do a load or store in WASM, it's, you know, it's, it's with either this memory it created itself or something it imported, and it's bounds checked because that memory has, has a length. And you know, we can optimize these bounds checks so they you know, don't end up, being, end up being too expensive in practice, but you know by when you create this module, it's not gonna be messing with random host memory that's in the same process. So you have this very strong kind of by default without you having to do anything, anything special, anything really magic, knowing that when you run this WASM code, it can only access that memory mm. and not your own memory. And you're like, well, what else can it do when I'm running? Well, uh, if I, first of all, if I haven't called it, it can't even run. So it's only running when I, when I called it. And then while it's running, what can it do? Well, it can only call functions that I gave it as imports. And that's it, like that's from the outside world. I, I can think about this without doing all sorts of really low level. If you look at the way people used to have to sandbox process, I mean, containers are a huge amount of effort to, and still ongoing <laughs> to sandbox things uh, with an interface that wasn't meant for virtualization. Whereas components are entirely designed around we want to be able to virtualize and sandbox these things. How can we make it as easy and natural as possible so it just feels like calling functions, you know, passing functions. Um, familiar, more familiar concepts. So how can we make, yeah, bring principal least authority, you know, to regular day-to-day -day programming development instead of like this like super elites, you know, uh, dark uh, magic. Uh, if I were to pick up on the container thing, the container, container comparison is a really useful one because it's something that we as an industry and communities have, have kind of suffered and succeeded through for 10 years or more uh, to understand and learn how it works. Um, the, the interesting thing about the container, again, hearkening back to exactly what Luke just described, all of those things are specified, and uh, in the W3C in particular, and the things that are like in component land that are being evolved will eventually end up there as well. Um, those things you can write tools against that help you make decisions that are good for you, right? The problem with containers is that they're blobs of native code that you must understand all the way back the, com the com compilation chain in order to even get a chance to do it. And we have scanners, for example, for containers now that are essentially native scanners. Just you can mount a file system and then run the native scanner through the file system and they come up with all kinds of things that are sometimes actual errors and they do a pretty good job, we must say. But also, they give you false positives, and they miss things, and, and so forth. And the difficulty there is that it's really hard to follow the code path, because it's a blob. It's an executable blob set. And in WebAssembly, we have the kinds of things that Luke was just talking about. We have the ability, and there are already tools for a lot of this stuff. Um, we have the ability to make tools that examine these code paths in advance, that understand imports and exports in advance. Some of these things are already here, but a lot more possibility exists. Um, and I think that, from a Microsoft point of view, for example, fills me with joy. I am 10 or 11 container years old, and that in container years is about 183, yep. and you can see it in the color of my hair. Um, and so when I look at it from that perspective of lived experience, um, the kind of tooling that I would build or that will be built or is being built to understand our components and our modules as they go together and as they execute is just filling me with joy. I am so looking forward to the next 10 years of distributed computing with WebAssembly. Whereas if you give me a container and tell me that you've got to do that for the next 10 years in all these different places where compute can happen, I am ready to retire. <laughs>
And so the joy that, that, that participating in this new technology, which I think is done well, um, I'll never compliment you in public again, okay? I just wanted to, <laughs> um, it, it, that's really important. It means that I go talk to my customers, I talk to the ecosystem, and I can, I can say, no, no, we can do this. What do you need the tool to tell you before you run that component? That's great. I want to talk about the sandbox before we end, because every time you look up something about Wasm security, it ends up being, oh, Wasm is safe because it has a sandbox. Um, Bailey, why don't we start with you and, you know, if you can share some thoughts about what it actually is like in, in reality and, um, you know, anything related to that. Sure. Um, you know, I think it fundamentally comes down to the thing that provides your sandbox is your runtime. Uh, so you are only as safe and secure uh, as good as your runtime is at providing that safety and security property. Um, Using the example that I gave before about I wrote some code, it did a double after free. Um, we do bounds checking as part of the semantics of WebAssembly. And so in that case, we would successfully trap. Now, if your runtime decided to disable bounds checking, um, or if it uh, had other types of maybe non-standard APIs that they've added to the way that they instrument and run that WebAssembly code, it's not going to be secure. You're going to you're going to break the sandbox. Or even if it was just a mistake in the coding, at that moment he was interrupted by the right. alarm clock or something. Yeah, and um, so we, we do a lot of work within the Bytecode Alliance Foundation and also in the CNCF for um, uh, running fuzzers, running sanitizers on your runtime. Um, but there's there's I think a lot there, right, on just proving the val validity of your WebAssembly runtime sandbox uh, capability. And um, mistakes happen. Uh, it's Even if your runtime is written in a memory safe language like Rust, there are still things <laughs> that we catch. And so it's, it's uh, really important, I think, when evaluating what runtime that you would want to use that um, you look at a few different types of properties that it provides, uh, if that is one of its key goals, or if its goal is to, you know, go fast, room room. Follow-up thoughts, Luke? Yeah, one other thought is um, low-level memory safety is a, uh, bugs are a large source of CVs, but importantly, log4j happened in a safe language, <laughs> and, uh, and so confused deputy attacks, overprivileged confused deputy attacks are a major also threat, and uh, so that's why where even if you are using a safe language and not even using its unsafe keyword, <laughs> um, controlling the uh, capabilities you give to uh, having fine-grained you know, blast zones and controlling the capabilities you give to them limits what happens when you accidentally embedded a total inter executable interpreter in the middle of this otherwise safe language. So, yeah. Oh, he just triggered me again. Um, <laughs> so, like, one of the questions I have gotten for several years, and you, there are all, a really bunch of cool tools out there that already do this, is, okay, great, uh, I, I'm gonna be able to m build my container as a WebAssembly module, right? Uh, with the idea that you can just X copy and just use WebAssembly as a new kind of container kind of thing. Um, but if you start thinking about the blast zone problem, right, and you've made the, uh, like containers make an OS assumption, like you can put anything in there because you have full power kind of thing, you're just removing the blast radius uh, constraint security tool that WebAssembly has given you. Um, and you haven't really changed the operating parameters of your code at all. Uh, you might, it might in theory be slightly more portable, but it's not necessarily gonna be faster. It might well be slower, for example, a little bit. You know, so it's important to realize that although we would like a make a container, a WebAssembly module, and my job's done kind of workflow, that's actually not what we want. Hmm as engineers. Um, there are going to be scenarios, of course, because engineering is, fits in every single niche of our existence. So there are gonna be scenarios where you really do take an entire kind of operating system chunk of code and put it in a WebAssembly module because that's simply how you need to be able to make it work. But we should not be wanting WebAssembly containers in the Dockerized sense in the sense of I want to X copy everything and it, it'll be WebAssembly and now it'll just run the same way. That, that, 
that doesn't change your security stance at all. And WebAssembly can't help you because you've made the OS assumption. It, the code can do whatever the operating system, you know, can do. That's, that's that, that, that it's it really interesting that you can think about containers and wanting to move them over. Mm -hmm. And it's actually what you should not want, which is one of my hot takes, I guess. Cool. Yeah, I think we're getting close to the end of this. So, um, you know, I just want to do more hot takes individually, <laughs> I guess. But um, any closing thoughts with um, something to think about for the audience in terms of what they can do to implement some security good practices within Mozum? I'll, I'll give my, like, not hot take first. Sure. Um, uh, and then, and then we can really go in. Um, but uh, the first one um, starts with your code uh, scanners that you're running today on your source code. Those just work. Uh, <laughs> so keep doing that uh, for WASM. The world doesn't have to look completely different uh, to be able to do this. It is a compilation target that many standard language libraries are adopting. Uh, and that means that other tools that are using it just work. Uh, you can inspect the module before you ever run it, right? The, the whole thing, especially with a WebAssembly component, it's practically declarative itself. You look at it, you can say, this is exactly what it needs to be able to run. That's really powerful. We as an industry need to really build an ecosystem around that. Um, we are emerging <laughs> right now, uh, and there's just so much opportunity there to expand that out. Um, I think, you know, I, I was just saying right before we got on here that I would love uh, to have like a little kind of indicator um, that shows me when I'm running a component, hey, this thing needs some extra stuff. Do you know what that extra stuff is? It's actually just like loading, you know, all of TensorFlow and like all these other things and it's loading it inside the runtime process and, you know, uh, if you're okay with that, cool. Uh, but maybe you might not be okay with that. And so there's just so many different things that I think we can build out as an industry. Um, I know you work with OpenSSF, mm -hmm. uh, and so having scorecards for WASM components would be amazing. I want that so bad. So uh, like that's that's one really great place that we can do this. Um, I just want to like double click into uh, Ralph's hot take here on uh, let's not make WASM, you know, POSIX 2.0. Uh, let's <laughs> let's think about about why we wanted to get here in the first place. And really, it's we want to be able to run just our business logic, just our code, right? And we want to run it in a way that's virtualizable so that we can run it safely inside a sandbox. And so when you pull in tons of other stuff into your WASM, that can be totally fine, right? Uh, I can virtualize an entire file system safely, securely, and I can make it read-only, even cooler. Uh, there's a tool like uh, for WASI Vert for that. Um, but let's think about when we're trying to build software architectures in a new way. We're able to finally actually take advantage of the Unix philosophy. I've, I talked a ton about this with Luke back in like Barcelona at WASM.io and it just really clicks because we can finally write one thing, make it do it extremely well, uh, and we now also have a common way of communicating uh, across these components. So let's build the right semantic APIs that are also taking advantage of all of these same properties that we're talking about, that it's virtualizable, that it's sandboxable, uh, and that it you know, makes sense and feels good to use. Uh, there's just so much opportunity there that we can take our code, make it work like how we're used to, uh, but then also think about the way that we're designing our program so that it works really well together. Ralph? Closing that was the best closing hot take I've seen. <laughs> that was a great summary. I don't have anything to add. What's going on that note? Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much for you know taking the time to be part of this panel and sharing all of these wonderful insights. And thank you all for being in attendance and being a great audience today. <laughs>